Well, good morning and thank you for being here in this Bible study. It's always an honor for me to be a part of, of delivering God's word, of, of helping folks and myself come to a better understanding. I'm Dave Layton and in this particular series of lessons, we're gonna be talking about the, the 12 apostles, the, the 12 original apostles. I've entitled the series, 12 Were Chosen, A Study of the Original Apostles. And of course, this is the intro lesson. It's remarkable when we study the apostles and we begin to see the genius of our Lord in, in selecting these men and training these men and then of course sending them out with the message of salvation. It's interesting to see that shortly after Jesus began his ministry, uh, large crowds began to follow him. And as we read in scripture, and we'll look at it in a few minutes a little bit more in detail, but from the greater number of disciples, those that were following Jesus, our, our Lord selected 12 men. One particular author that I read in preparing this material used the expression that these men were extraordinary in their ordinariness. And I, I found that fascinating because there truly was nothing uh, remarkable about these 12 men except that they were ordinary men, but they had potential. They had the raw materials to carry out the mission that Jesus would give them. They were not uh, intellectual giants or leaders in their community or in the Jewish faith, just ordinary people. And that's remarkable because that's what we are. And, and so we're ordinary people. And so we learn from these people. We learn uh, from the 12 apostles uh, how to become extraordinary, allowing God's power to work through us. Our Lord knew that these men had a wealth of raw material that had the potential to do what was necessary. And except for Judas Iscariot, uh, the one who betrayed Jesus, uh, they learned to turn their lives over to Jesus. And because of that, they, w they went from being ordinary to extraordinary. And again, that's the overall message for us uh, we, we can do or, uh, extraordinary things for the master. Uh, we learn and we put into practice turning our life over to him. By the way, the extraordinary things we do are not in the way of miraculous gifts or anything of that nature. We simply develop the knowledge and courage to tell about Jesus and to help other people change their lives. So just like these men, we learn that the power is not in us. The power is in God working through us. And the more we turn our life over to the Lord, as these 12 men, uh, excuse me, the 11 men learn to do, not, not Judas, unfortunately, but, but the other 11, as they learn to do that, uh, they, they became more and more uh, valuable servants for our Lord. It's interesting as we look in Scripture, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. This is right after the day of Pentecost when, when the church is established. Right after that period of time, we see the early actions of the church. And of special note is the statement in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It simply says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. That's a remarkable statement. They took ownership of what Jesus had told them. They took ownership of the command Jesus had given them to teach his teachings to the rest of us. And we see it happening there. But we continue to do that today. We take the teachings that are given to us in the New Testament that are delivered to us by these men and, and we, we use them to carry out the mission that came to us. And so we're going to look in this lesson at strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we'll look at what we can learn from each of these men. I wanna first of all make mention though of what our lesson objectives are. And this is for the entire series. As we go through this, what I'd like us to do first of all is we wanna learn from the apostles. We wanna learn how to accomplish God's will. The apostles help us discover that will and then also how to accomplish it. And we're going to learn the characteristics that enable us to influence others for Jesus, you know, that truly is what leadership is. Leadership is the ability to influence others. And so we're going to teach about how we can lead others to Jesus. And we're going to learn that in ourselves and then teach others. Uh, we're going to value 
what the apostles are as their role models, uh, as they serve the Lord. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to learn that as they serve the Lord, we too can serve the Lord. Not, not only the action of serving the Lord, but how to do that according to the Lord's will. And then, of course, we have to put that into action. It's, it's, it's wonderful to know something and to feel something, but we need to put it into action. We need to do something. And the doing in a general way is simply to apply the characteristics of the apostles. We're, we're going to be learning what those characteristics were. But we put those in our lives. We, we learn to imitate them, as Paul would say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so we're going to learn to take those characteristics, those good things that they teach us, put them in our lives, make them a part of who we are. And, and we begin then to change into who God wants us to be. God wants us to be like his son, Jesus. And that's what we're going to learn. As, as we go through uh, these particular lessons, we're going to have a pattern of looking at the apostles, the characteristics they have, and then what we learn from them. But in this particular lesson, this is an introduction to uh, the, the ideas of what is an apostle. What's the difference between an apostle and a disciple? We're going to look a little bit about how Jesus prepared himself and then how he selected these 12 men. And then I want to look at what the apostles had to overcome. Because again, Jesus took them where they were and taught them and guided them to begin to become what he wanted them to be. Uh, that's what happens with us. And so we're going to learn, uh, as we'll see, that what the apostles had to overcome are the same things we have to overcome in our lives. And, and so we're going to learn how they overcame those, what that means to us, and how we can learn to do that as well. Well, I'd like to begin by simply looking at what is the difference between a disciple and an apostle. These are two terms that we see used a lot uh, in the ministry of our Lord. At times we see disciple, at times we see apostle, and sometimes they're referring to the same person or same group of people. But there are two distinctions here. First of all, the idea of a disciple. A disciple is simply somebody uh, that, that is a follower or a student, a learner of a, a person who was addressed, as we saw so many times with Jesus, as the master or the teacher. Uh, that was the educational system of the time. Uh, a, a lot of learning happened through the synagogues. Uh, we, we, we know that the uh, general population, the apostles especially, had knowledge of Scripture. We saw it come out many times, and we'll look at, at that as we look at these individual men. But then they would begin to follow somebody. They would declare themselves to be a disciple of someone. And in the context of these lessons, of course, they became disciples of Jesus. Now, some of the apostles were chosen, of course, by Jesus. We have that references in Scripture. Some of the apostles uh, were chosen, but we don't know how they were chosen. Uh, it's possible that some of them may just have decided to follow Jesus, and then he did select them to be apostles. But, but a disciple is simply a follower, somebody who is uh, a learner, a pupil. Of course, we're very familiar with the passage of Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. This is referred to as the Great Commission. It's, it's where Jesus uh, told the apostles to go into all the world to make disciples of him and then to baptize them and then to teach them all that he had commanded them. And so Jesus is giving this to the 12 apostles. He's giving it to us by extension because that's what we do. But they become learners first. They become disciples. And then they take the learning uh, that they've received. They apply it through their baptism, which is, is their, their obedient faith uh, that we see demonstrated. And then uh, they continue to learn. We continue to teach. We continue to learn. So in the Gospels, we see the term disciple used to describe both followers of Christ in general and the 12 apostles specifically. And, and today, when, when we obey God's command for uh, our salvation, God's plan for our salvation, we become disciples of Jesus. Now, that's the term disciple. A more specific term, of course, is apostle. Apostle means the sent out or the sent ones. This was a special designation. Uh, it, it, it 
they, they became disciples and then they were appointed to be apostles. So an apostle carries out a more uh, uh, or has a more significant role uh, as an ambassador, as, a, as an official representative. This person speaks with authority of the one that sent them. We're going to look at this, but Jesus imparted upon these 12 men power and authority. Uh, they, they could act on his behalf. Uh, we're, we're going to see where they receive miraculous powers uh, and, and a greater depth of knowledge. And, and today, we become disciples. We do not become his apostles. The, the, the concept of apostle is just a more designated uh, term. And Jesus specifically appointed these men to become his apostles. Uh, Jesus appointed them directly. Well, with the idea then of what a disciple is and what an apostle is, let, let's talk about uh, how Jesus selected the 12, how he, he prepared himself and then he selected the 12. Uh, when we read of the account of selecting the 12, you can find it in uh, Luke chapter 6, but also in, in Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 19. I, I'd like to put the emphasis on Luke chapter 6, uh, starting there in verse 12. We read here where Jesus had a night of prayer with the Father. Uh, of course, we know it was a common habit of Jesus to, to pray, to, to communicate with the Father, but this was a special occasion, and, and that's what we see in Scripture uh, prior to a very special event or that's going to happen. Uh, we saw it in the Garden of Gethsemane before his trial, his arrest and trial. But we see it here before he's selecting these 12 men. This was going to be a very significant event to select these 12 men because they're going to be the ones that are carrying the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ out to all the world. So Jesus, uh, after a night of prayer... He then calls his disciples as a group together. And then from this larger group, he appointed the 12. He selected the 12. And then in the various counts of the apostles of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, we read about the listing of the 12, who they were. John does not give us the specific listing of the 12, but John gives us a lot of detail in his gospel about the actions of the apostles. And we see... In Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 10, starting there in verse 1, we see that Jesus not only selected these 12, but he gave to them extraordinary power. He gave to them miraculous power to not only uh, heal the sick and, and cast out demons, as the text said, but as they go out on his behalf, they would proclaim him as the Messiah. So they had an extra level of knowledge and insight. At times they had that and may not even have realized it as we see. But we'll read about that in Matthew chapter 10. Up to this point, the 12 were just a part of the larger group of disciples. Uh, Jesus called them to follow him. Now others followed as well. Uh, uh, may have uh, invited others to follow even. We, we don't know. We, we have the record of some of the apostles being called as I've already said. But it really brings up an interesting point. So why would Jesus select 12? Well, what's the importance of 12? It's, it's not necessarily a, a, some special number other than the fact that it is symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. And, and scholars uh, look at this number and that's what they say this is what it symbolizes. And I think that's very obvious. The 12 apostles not only were a, a carryover of the 12 tribes, but the idea of the 12 tribes, but it was now uh, God's new kingdom. And these men would be leading us for all of the rest of history will be leading us into the new kingdom. Uh, later, as the disciples were waiting for the arrival of the Holy Spirit, uh, they recognized the importance of this 12. Uh, Peter stands up and he, he talks about how Jesus appointed 12 and how they need to uh, complete what Scripture says by replacing uh, someone to replace Judas Iscariot. And of course, we knew that was Matthias. We read about that in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Uh, we'll, we'll study that a little bit later in the lesson. 
What I'd like to do now though, so we, we've talked about uh, what a disciple is, what an apostle is. We've talked about how Jesus prepared himself and we've talked about the significance of there being 12 of these men. You know, it's interesting, you would think how in the world 12 men were going to complete going into all the world. The idea of one person spending all their time just teaching, teaching, teaching. Well, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, Jesus in, in Acts, uh, as, as he's preparing to ascend back into heaven, tells the apostles to go back to Jerusalem. And uh, from there, they'll learn what to do. And we know then in Acts chapter 2 how Pentecost came about. But then later, as we begin to continue in the study of Acts, we begin to see uh, that the Christians were persecuted and they were scattered out. The Christians were, the, the new followers of Christ. The 12 apostles remained in Jerusalem. So what we had going on there was a multiplication effect. And we know through the course of history, as in fact, the book of Acts tells us, as these Christians went out, they carried the gospel with them. So the original charge was given to the 12. Those 12 then gave it to others. Those others gave it to others. And so it was a multiplication effect that went out. So the 12 didn't do it just by themselves. They taught others, prepared others. And, and by the way, that's what we do. Uh, we, we also teach others. And then those others teach others. And this multiplication effect continues on. We're able to go into all the world, not directly ourselves, not the apostles directly themselves, but others going out on their behalf. So that's how the 12 carried the gospel into all the world. I want to take a few minutes to take a look at how uh, the, the 12 apostles are structured and, and how they're put together. It's fascinating to look at these uh, men to, to see how uh, they, they were organized in and amongst themselves. Uh, there is structure, there is pattern there, and, and certainly we know that if God does anything, uh, He does things by a pattern. He has a purpose in that and it's communicated sometimes with a pattern. But the 12 are arranged in three groups. Uh, this is fairly consistent through the listings. Uh, we have it in Matthew and Mark and Luke. We don't have it, as I mentioned, in John, uh, the listing of them. We have the actions, but not the listing. And then we have Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 13, where uh, they are meeting together to replace uh, uh, Judas Iscariot. Matthias is selected. We'll, we'll talk about that. But uh, here we, we see uh, the listing as well. So we have four listings of the apostles, and there's a pattern in all four of these listings. Group one is always uh, listing, uh, in, in all the lists, group one, Peter is the first one that's listed. Uh, Peter first, and then we see within that group, uh, uh, Andrew, James, and John. But as you can see in, in the listing, there's a little bit of difference in the, in the sequence, but these four men are always listed together, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Uh, they were among the first disciples that Jesus called to himself. We read about that in John chapter 1, verses uh, 35 through 42. Uh, these four men are often seen with Jesus at significant moments in his ministry. Uh, it's interesting that we see Peter, James, and John as an even closer group to Jesus. For some reason, Andrew uh, is, is not seen consistently uh, through significant times, but we do see uh, Peter, James, and John. They're, they're an even closer inner circle with Jesus. For example, we see these men at the Transfiguration. We see them at the Garden of Gethsemane. Now we go to group two. Group two begins with Philip, and uh, then it, can, it includes Bartholomew, who by the way in John is referred to as Nathaniel. And then we see Matthew and Thomas. Group three is led by James, the son of Alphaeus, and includes Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James, called Thaddeus in Mark and Labaius in Matthew. And then we also see Judas Iscariot. Uh, Judas Iscariot always appears last, and except for uh, the narrative, of course, in uh, Acts, we see him listed with the 12. 
Uh, we see major differences among these disciples, but we also see some similarities. Uh, for example, a, uh, a major difference uh, in their personalities, their professions and, and activities, uh, Matthew was a tax collector, uh, somebody that would have been certainly despised, as we know from reading in the Gospels. But here he has among his brothers, Simon the Zealot. And a zealot was uh, somewhat of an activist is what we would call them today. Uh, this person, a zealot, was sworn to overcome, overthrow Romans or anybody that represented Rome. So he would have been an enemy of Matthew, uh, even, even swearing to kill the person. So now you have Matthew, the tax collector, representative of Rome, and Simon the zealot, who is a mortal enemy. And yet here the two men are brought together by Jesus. You, you want evidence of Jesus changing people's lives? These two men show a, a, a major example of that. Uh, we also have Peter. Of course, we know Peter as being brash and outspoken, uh, very aggressive. And, and then you see John who often worked with Peter uh, as, as the Church began, and as it grew in, in Acts, we see John. And we see Peter being very brash, John being uh, not so much, or not as outspoken as Peter, not somebody who jumps in quickly as Peter would do. You know, I touched on it a little bit, but I think it's worth repeating. When you look at these men, and I've only given you a few examples here, but a major point of note, I, I just... Find it remarkable of all the people that Jesus could have selected to be his ambassadors, to carry the gospel to all the world. He selected these 12 ordinary men, men that, that just had so much to overcome as we're going to look at in a minute, but they were just ordinary men. They weren't rabbis. They weren't scholars. They, they, they knew scripture from what they had been taught, but they, they had not attended higher levels of education up to this point. Uh, they, they, they were not priests. Uh, they were not synagogue or community leaders. They were ordinary people, ordinary workmen. Uh, they, as I said, not highly educated. Matthew probably had some education because of his role as a tax collector. There's indications that John had a level of education, but by and large, they were not anything about, there, there was not anything about these men that was extraordinary. And that in and of itself is just a fascinating point. Jesus changed these men. And we see that throughout uh, all of scripture. It's, it's not about us. It's about God working through us. So again, these 12 ordinary men had a lot that they had to face, and Jesus gave them some specific taskings. Jesus delegated his authority to the 12 and sent them out with his message. And that's what they did. They carried his message. Even though, as we see in Acts chapter uh, 2, and I mentioned verse 42, continuing in the apostles' teachings, well, the apostles were teaching about Jesus and what Jesus had given them to teach. In Mark chapter 3, verse 14, uh, we, we see a process there. Uh, Jesus selected them. He would teach them. He would send them out then uh, in that role. But it's fascinating as you read through Scripture and you read the interactions with Jesus and these apostles, there was a, a remarkable event that happened in Matthew chapter 16. Now we understand from this that Jesus had asked the question of the 12 apostles, who do men say that I am? And they related to him what the common thoughts were. You're, you're a prophet, you're John the Baptist. And, and then Jesus asked a more specific question to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, answers, you're the Christ, the Son of the, God, of the living God. And because of that, Jesus then uh, blesses, he praises Peter. But then he addresses the twelve are together and he tells them, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, some people think he's speaking specifically to Peter in this, but he's actually speaking to the twelve together. That you, that he uses there as a plural, 
So I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is a remarkable level of power. We refer to that as apostolic authority. And so when Acts chapter two, the apostles took ownership of the teachings of Jesus and they used it then to further the cause of Christ, to carry out the gospel. And although Jesus taught many times to different groups we see in his ministry while he's here on earth, that as, as he began to draw closer to the end of his ministry, he began to focus more and more on these 12 men. And he was preparing them then to carry out the ministry, teaching others to do so. And today we do the same. Well, I'd like to go ahead and transition now into what we learned from these men. And, and the way I'm going to do this simply is saying, what did they lack? What are, what are these things, the spiritual understanding, the humility, faith, commitment, and power? These things that the, the 12 apostles uh, didn't have a great amount of, and, and they grew in these areas. And, and we look at that and how they grew in the areas, and we see that we can learn something from that as well. So let's begin by talking about briefly the lack of spiritual understanding. Uh, Jesus uh, kept teaching them, uh, even after his resurrection, as, as he's preparing to ascend to the Father there in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, we see he's continuing to teach them. Uh, that there were misunderstandings that they had uh, about spiritual things. They, they had been taught uh, what was commonly expected of who the Messiah was going to be and what was going to happen. And they, they asked the question, is, is now when you're going to establish the kingdom? They were still uh, misunderstanding. So they grew in understanding, but, but it took quite a bit. But Jesus kept teaching them, kept teaching them. Uh, several times in Scripture, it's noted that they just didn't understand the teachings of Jesus or how events were associated with prophecy. I'm struck by uh, what John says in uh, John uh, chapter 20, verse 9. It uh, talks about uh, even as Peter and John go to the tomb and see that Christ has risen, uh, the, the John states that they didn't understand that he must rise from the dead, uh, even though he has risen from the dead. So that was just a lot spiritual things that they had to first unlearn uh, some mistakes and then learn the truth. Well, we too lack spiritual understanding. And, and, and like the apostles, uh, we learn through studying what, the, what our master teaches us. We meditate upon God's word. We pray for understanding. We pray for wisdom, all of these things. And we too have misunderstandings. We too sometimes misapply scripture. And so we continue to study and grow. We do that by studying the apostles' teachings, studying through especially the New Testament writings, uh, God's will for us as citizen in his, in, citizens in his kingdom. Now they also lacked humility. Uh, that, that was very obvious. Uh, they were at times self-absorbed, self-promoting. They even argued over who would be first in the kingdom or greatest in the kingdom. I, I'm, I'm always struck by that. Here they stand in the presence of Jesus Christ, who they know is the Son of God, and they're talking about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Uh, that, that just strikes me almost as humorous, but, but it's a very serious point. And Jesus overcame the lack of humility that these men uh, uh, possessed by demonstrating humility, by using himself as an example. He humbled himself, even unto his death, and, and, and he taught them humility. He taught them about the value of humility, the value of you want to be greatest in the kingdom, you be least. Uh, he, he taught them all the time about this and showed it to them. Uh, we, we know the, the, perhaps the greatest event, of even the night of his arrest, he's washing the disciples' feet. By the way, even Judas, who he knew was going to betray him, Jesus is washing their feet, teaching them to be servants, to be humble servants. And that's a wonderful lesson for us today. And we're going to look at each of these 12 men as we go through and see how humility, learning humility, played a key role in what they became. Well, our usefulness to God begins with our humble acceptance of His will, and it continues to grow as we grow spiritually. We learn to put God's will ahead of ours. And, and this shows God's power, not ours. It glorifies God 
to our actions. Well, they also lacked faith. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Jesus used the expression, O oh, you of little faith. He, he said it three times in Matthew and once in the book of Luke. It wasn't a, con a, a condemnation of any kind. It was simply a, 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 a challenge for them to grow. And so Jesus kept teaching them. Uh, he would do miracles that not only showed his deity, but also to help increase their faith. And, and uh, you know, faith is a foundation of our relationship with God. Uh, the Hebrew writer states, uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And, and so we learn how to develop faith and grow in faith as, as uh, we study the apostles' lives and, and put into practice what they teach us about that. Well, they certainly lacked commitment at times. You know, they had declared that they would follow Jesus even to the death. But after the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, they all fled. Jesus knew they would. Uh, we see Peter, certainly prominent among them, the, the account there in John of denying Christ three times, uh, even swearing that he did not know Jesus. Well, Jesus overcame their lack of commitment by teaching, by forgiving, by praying for them. We read about that in John 17. What a remarkable prayer that is. And there amongst that praying for those 12 disciples, Jesus also prays for us that we too will be faithful, that we too will be united in, in our efforts, not only to follow him, but to teach him to others. He prayed for us. So all of us experience periods when our commitment wavers. Well, much of the New Testament is, is given to us to strengthen our faith, to, to underpin our commitment. Again, the apostles teach us by example. We see how their faith grew, their commitment grew. Well, they also lacked power. Uh, on their own, uh, they certainly were weak and helpless. Uh, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost as he had promised to empower them. And as we grow spiritually, we see more and more God's power working in us and we continue to grow our faith, our commitment, uh, our humility, our spiritual understanding, all of these continue to grow as we dedicate ourselves to the Lord. We enter into a relationship with the Holy Spirit upon our baptism. And then as a result of that, we begin to grow spiritually. And all of the power of God works through us as we continue to turn our lives over more and more to Jesus Christ. Now, I want to pause here just a second and, and add in a point here. Uh, a lot of people like to study why, or excuse me, how the apostles died. And, and it's fascinating to me. Uh, it's, it's just a common question, and there's certainly nothing wrong with asking it. Scripture only tells us how James and Judas Iscariot died. John seems to have been the only one of the original apostles that, that died of natural causes. Uh, as for others, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of secular uh, writings outside of biblical writings about um, how the uh, apostles died, where they traveled to, um, other various things that they were engaged in. <clears throat> but it's interesting of the, the, uh, how this secular history sometimes even gives different ways that a particular apostle might have died. And, and so they're in conflict with each other. There, there are just simply no biblical writings of how the others, except for James and Judas Iscariot, died. But perhaps we're looking at it incorrectly. Rather than worrying about how these men physically died, I know this for a fact. With the exception of Judas Iscariot, these 12 men died faithful. And I think that's an important lesson for us to follow. They died faithful. No matter the method, the physical method of their death, their spirit was faithful to the Lord. They had committed to following Jesus even to the death. Their faith had waned at times, but they regained their faith by focusing on Jesus and became faithful to him and continued to grow in that. Well, let me wrap the lesson up. As I said, this is an introductory lesson. We're seeing the, these men making a transition, a journey to Christ-likeness. Uh, they were ordinary, uh, nothing about them, uh, but they allowed God to work through them. That's the key. 
God worked through them. Uh, the same happens to us today. Uh, God takes the raw material, the potential we have, when we turn it over to him, we become his instruments and his disciples, and, and we grow and learn. And part of that process is we develop an overwhelming desire to teach the master to others. So during the presentation, we talked about the difference between an apostle and a disciple, uh, how Jesus prepared himself and selected the 12, uh, the tasking of these men, what he gave to them, and of course, we learn from what they had to overcome, we learn as well what we can overcome by allowing God to work through us. Well, this concludes the introductory class, and I appreciate your time so very much. Uh, as we now begin to look at uh, these 12 men, we're going to look with a pattern of what Scripture tells us about these men and then what we can learn from these men. So again, I thank you very much for your time. Friends, in all things, we give God the glory. Thank you.